Imaginary Worlds, where oh, they were doing something on PKD's 2374 visions. And uh, it was good fun. We'll see what they come up with. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, we're, we're streaming now to Facebook. So, hey, everybody. Um, we are live on Neural Learning, and uh, it's great to be back. This is session five of uh, PKD, Valis, and Practices of Ultra Metacognition. Uh, thanks for joining us and tuning in. I see you've already got some folks tuning in from the Facebook page. Great. And um, yeah, so this is session five, and we're going over and we're exploring a scanner darkly. And we are uh, once again with uh, Richard Doyle from Penn State, and we are happy to be joining you. And if you want to be on the mailing list, and if you're not uh, familiar with the mailing list at all, I'm going to post that in the chat. You can just join us um, on Neura. It's a class portal where there's um, actually extra downloads and extra class materials, recordings of all of the sessions, and the uh, transcript of the chat box. Really recommend it. There's a lot of rich information here. Um, for instance, Tessa Dick has been joining us in the chat and adding some great biographical context uh, to the conversations, and everyone's thoughts are just really great and in insightful. So definitely check that out in the in the chat when I post uh, on Facebook as well. So yeah, so welcome, Rich. Thanks for joining us again. And uh, I've got your slides here, and we we are ready to go. Thanks, Jeremy. It's uh, feels like we've been doing these forever. Every week, it feels like uh, <laughs> something that just always has happened and always will be happening, which is a good thing. And I think that the reason it feels that way is that when you start to get the dosage up on, you know, even if you just take a whack at a PKD novel for a week and you read seventy percent of it, or fifty percent, or a hundred percent you cross some kind of threshold dosage uh, situation where, um, you know, you have enough subroutines in your uh, narrative mind to turn everything into a kind of connection to a Philip K. Dick novel. You know, last week we talked a little bit about how Ubrick leverages the always existing uh, virtual reality of thermodynamics and entropy to kind of remind us anytime, you know, I, I see the snow thawing, you know, and the water flowing. I see energy dissipating and I see everything trying to cool itself, you know, that Ubik is in, in a way about, you know, cooling down everything, the energy trying to disperse. And I have those moments and it's simultaneously sublime, of course, because it's a kind of image of spring and of life, you know, that when things are starting to flow and the, uh, the snow is melting and the birds are going crazy because they're just like, incipient insects, you know, about to be. And, um, you know, you have that simultaneous feeling of that intensive feeling of, you know, animation. And this idea that we live in this kind of always entropic world where, you know, life and death are non-dual states that, you know, all the birds are going crazy because they're going to eat those <laughs> incipient insects and the water is, you know, cooling and you know, everything is cooling itself as quickly as it can it's trying to throw off that heat energy so to me i find that kind of almost a psychedelic effect where if i've read ubic i can walk around outside in thermodynamic you know just in the therm 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 invisible thermodynamic land and say wow you know um i'm not sure where the boundary of that book really leaves off and where my you know world begins and and to me that's the essence of the sort of phil dickian effect i mean there are a lot of other characteristics but to me that's the essence of it and i think um as we've been talking uh, over the weeks there's a sense that um the effects of pkd's writings have been sort of cast as sort of inducing paranoia or being kind of you know, obsessed, almost obsessive compulsive about, you know, what is real. And um, I think that Skinner, Darkly, and Ubik both show that, in fact, even when there's this very tragic vision where you can see in Skinner, Darkly, that Dick, again, prophetically telling the story of the drug war better than, you know, we, we could have told it retroactively, right? Somehow, in 1974, he sees, you know, through the the glass not darkly and sees exactly what the kind of archetypical situation is uh, that was the drug war even by 1974 
and so it's there's no doubt that there's a kind of um darkness that um the novel makes us or at least solicits us into contemplating we have to sort of be with the tragic nature of uh the scenario here but there's so much warmth and comedy in it that are so obviously kind of these signs of life these vital signs that no matter uh sort of how ridiculous and manichaean you know the drug war became where you had these you know a character that is reporting on themselves right you know that um that there was something that it couldn't quite grasp and what what it couldn't grasp and what it couldn't uh really incarcerate or defeat or squelch was a cultural concern with uh, the unchanging, that which is behind all of this, that, that which is somehow more real than the consumer culture that is marketed to people at the time, that is more real than the suburban culture that uh, Dick is kind of beholding and not simply skewering, but, you know, looking at and saying, what's it like to live inside of that? You know, what happens when you hit your head on a Formica countertop and you have an epiphany and you say to yourself, not this, not this, this, this is not it. Neti, neti, right. Um, that, that there's a sense in which he was both seeing the darkness already of what the drug war was. And I think we have not even remotely begun to grapple with and fathom sort of what the drug war was. In other words, beyond even its uh, enormous human impact or the delight that we can take uh, right now that at least in, on certain, in certain domains, on certain fronts, it appears to be in a temporary anyway retreat. Um, and so it's, it's allowing us to sort of look back, but that sense of relief needs to point us to this uh, kind of sense of really hosting and honoring what that was, you know, th what the drug war was. And what I want to suggest tonight is, is that um, if you read a scanner uh, darkly carefully, or even if you just read at it intensely for short bits, um, you'll see that in a way what uh, the drug war was about was precisely about blocking access to ultra medic, what Dick will call ultra metacognition. That um, what we now call consciousness culture that grew out of, you know, the prohibition uh, against psychedelics and the exploration of modes of consciousness expansion that include books uh, that you know, this, this sense of um, uh, being part of a lineage here that, you know, that, that Dick is one of the, you know, preeminent writers of consciousness culture. And that when he's looking at these characters in this, I think, very humane and funny way, and caring and compassionate way, that he's strangely enough giving us a snapshot of really what the drug war is in its essence in other words not what does it look like on its surface who who really is the drug war and i think that uh for example uh the pondering of the character bob Arctor Arctor slash fred you know where he's wondering you know who am i am i bob Arctor? am i fred and obviously he's neither right he's that which is capable of observing Bob Arctor and Fred. And that is an act, when, when we realize that, when we ask the who am I question uh, about who we are, we're really engaging in ultra metacognition. And what I wanna show is at least that one thread that is in the book that is worth tugging on is where characters are put into this situation where their ability to engage in ultra metacognition is thwarted. And what I want to suggest is, is that one name for that. So this is just in a scrawl um, that I sent you. Um, 
you want to put that up, but you don't have to actually, because it's so illegible. I just want it to be a kind of transcription of what happens to me sometimes when I'm reading Dick's novels. Um, and at the top, it has, you know, kind of in set brackets, institution is that which thwarts ultra metacognition. In other words, a useful heuristic definition of an, of an institution in the world of Scanner Darkly is that which thwarts ultra metacognition because it answers uh, the who am I impulse that we all have. We all have this fundamental searching, uh, loving aspect to ourselves where we really wish to know, you know, who we are and what we're doing here. And uh, it's interesting to watch um, the characters kind of nosing around that, you know, really asking this question of who am I actually? Am I Bob Arctor or I'm Fred? You know, let's hear it for the vague blur, that it, it produces this questioning of identity, which if we'll carry it out, if we'll in introspect our immediate identity, we'll kind of see that it is kind of a vague blur, you know, that Fred is Fred when he shows up to work and he's Bob when he shows up at home. And, you know, even without a scramble suit or holotapes or substance D, uh, we're all kind of in that situation because we're constantly hovering around the recognition that we're a deeply decentralized self, that we have different aspects that show up in uh, different situations. And every now and then uh, we get a glimpse of that. And when we get a glimpse of that, we might ask the question, well, who am I really? You know, am I the person who shows up tired at the end of a Monday of teaching to uh, share whatever kind of enthusiasms I have about Phil K. Dick, you know, am I the person who gets into a kind of polemical argument at a, a faculty meeting? Am I, you know, the person who rides his bike and, you know, feels the breeze on his face? And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm the being which is capable of all of those, all of those mixture uh, uh, of experiences. Um, but we tend to ossify and cluster those experiences under this experience of, uh, under this name of identity. And what's fascinating is the way in which PKD seems to be scratching away at that in a way that anticipates what he'll do in Vallis, where um, he distributes himself as a character across both Phil, the science fiction writer, and Horse Lover Fat, the thinly veiled pseudonym for Phil K. Dick. So if I look really quickly, um, I didn't take pictures of it of the page this time, but I can probably find it pretty well. I have the um, this Vantage edition uh, this week. I, I really, I really loved this uh, sequence. It, like having them all in a row looks kind of, you know, amazing. And you can see that I, I live with these books. This is uh, well worn. It's like the Velveteen Rabbit. It takes on more reality the more it's kind of like degraded or eroded. Um, and so. Uh, what I wanted to point to was this beautiful opening se sequence um, with Charles Freck, um, who's cruising along in his car, hoping to score about 10 deaths in order to supplement the amount that he has buried in his backyard. Uh, and he's rolling along and on the Vantage edition, this is page nine, um, He's doing what he calls running a number in his head. In other words, he's kind of watching a, a series of a, nar a narrative of thoughts under go going on in his head. He's experiencing metacognition. He's watching this happen. He's saying, seen the first Episcopal Church of Pasadena at 8.30 a.m. on Crash Sunday. Crash Sunday being the day when, which is the, the nightmare of, of all the addicts, when everyone runs out at once. Holy parishioners, let us now call on God at the time to request his intervention in the agonies of those who are thrashing about on their beds, withdrawing. Yeah, yeah, the congregation agreeing with the priest. But before he intervenes with a fresh supply of, and then Charles Freck's metacognition is interrupted by some other metacognition. A black and white evidently had noticed something in Charles Freck's driving he hadn't noticed. Right, so you see even what's happening in that sentence, he's realizing that he was, paying attention to the number running in his head, 
and not observing his own driving. He wasn't uh, engaging in metacognition of his own driving. And he, and he noticed that he wasn't engaging in metacognition around his own, own driving. So he wasn't observing his own driving and he observed and became aware that he was not knowing his, his own driving. And so that is in fact, technically a little experience of ultra metacognition. It had taken off from its parking spot, was moving along behind him in traffic so far without lights or siren, but dot, 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 ellipsis. And of course we can all, we're all there, right? This is what um, the uh, French Marxist philosopher, Louis Althusser called interpolation. It's the response we have to the police when they say either in spoken or unspoken terms, hey, you, right? We feel ourselves already kind of addressed, already I'm being looked at, I'm being uh, 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 um, hailed, as Althusser puts it. So, and the power of that hailing, the power, power of what happens to Charles Freck's mind when he sees the black and white pole behind him is he immediately begins tell, telling a story about himself in which he's helpless. That moment of ultra metacognition that he had immediately gets answered. Who am I? I am a criminal, right? A black and white evidently had noticed something in Charles Freck's driving he hadn't noticed. It had taken off from his parking spot, was moving along behind him in traffic so far without lights or siren, but, right? So that so far without lights and siren, of course, he, he, the, the story is already off, right? He's already connecting the dots. He's creating a story in which he is the star character and he is a criminal. So again, instead of really asking the question, you know, oh, who am I such that, you know, I can imagine these elaborate fantasies about Crash Sunday, you know, um, he's immediately brought back to the demand to be Charles Freck. Maybe I'm weaving or something, he thought. Fucking goddamn Fuzzmobile saw me fucking up. I wonder what. Cop, all right, what's your name? My name? Can't think of name. You don't know your own name? Cop signals to other cop in prowl car. This guy is really space. Don't shoot me here, Charles Freck, in his horror fantasy number, induced by the sight of the black and white pacing him. At least take me to the station house and shoot me there, out of sight. So, of course, like, we, we probably glide right over this. And we think, like, oh, well, that's, that's not a drug. The vision of a black and white rolling behind a car <clears throat> in the context of a drug war, that can't throw hallucinations into the mind of a human being of a, of a car. But, of course, this is one of the most powerful. This is at least as powerful of a hallucination as the idea that Jerry Fabin has that there are uh, aphids in his hair, right? And then he's inhaling them. And then he can put them in jars, um, and crucial to this one is this hallucination uh, and this narrative, this story centers around the need to be able to tell someone else who you are. And he momentarily doesn't know. And he doesn't know because, and this is where I'm going against the grain of the narrative, where, of course, we sympathize with these characters because their brains are being fried in certain ways by these drugs. The, Wires to the cephscope are being broken. Um, there's no question about that. And there is entropy there, right? But it's also actually um, a really, really good question to ask, you know, who am I? And that because they're constantly engaging in the programming and metaprogramming of their own consciousness, they're all what the German writer Ernst Jünger called psychonauts, they're all investigating the space of their own consciousness. Not only are they dealing with the kind of bad effects of this uh, obviously noxious, uh, toxic drug that is being distributed by a large scale drug monopoly. Sound familiar, Palmer Eldridge? Sound familiar, Leo Bolero? Um, and is poisoning, you know, and bifurcating uh, the minds of the users, there's also this really beautiful moment. It's, it's a non-dual moment because even in the horror of that toxicity, uh, we can see that Charles Freck is actually asking the right question, that he doesn't know who he is, that the idea of not knowing who you are is not a symptom of a drug intoxication or a toxin. 
it's actually an empirical observation that we are instead a flow of consciousness that is capable of spinning out these fantasy numbers, capable of being affected by other people, and that that flow of consciousness can only momentarily be arrested around individual identities, but it's not essentially those identities. And we can, we can observe that on our own. And we can observe that in a, in a moment of ultra metacognition where, you know, we can wonder over who it is that is reading this book. And you might say, well, that's a very simple uh, and, and weird and silly question to ask because we know full well who is reading the book. And of course, we're not asking, you know, is Charles Freck reading the book? Is Richard Doyle reading the book? We're asking, say, hey, you know, just as Charles, Fre Charles Freck has observed this black and white coming behind him, can we take our awareness and look back on our own experience and say, is our own experience, let alone that of Bob Fred's, is it capturable by an identity? And if it's not capturable by an identity, are we sometimes making the mistake of mistaking ourselves for our holotapes? That is, of listening to the internal chatter that we all have as our self-referential internal narrative in which we've all got ourselves under surveillance, of course. Do we sometimes mistake ourselves for that and think that that's who we really are? As opposed to, no, that's just one of the readouts of the holotape. And by observing the holotape, by observing our own internal self-referential narrative, which is at least as wacky of that of Barris's and Bob Arctor's and Charles Freck's and Ernie's and Rat Radass, right? Our own internal self-referential narrative is at least as Baroque as all of that, at least, you know, mine is. And so if we observe that or has been, and if we really start to look at that and say, oh my gosh, look, I've just mistaken myself for the narrative that I'm telling about myself. And when we do that, we can feel that there's enormous freedom. It's the liberation from the bondage to any particular story and the invitation to dwell in the infinite space of story that all of these characters and all of us are capable of. I mean, think about an unbelievably uh, creative Charles Freck's little fantasy number is as he's rolling along. And in fact, the fantasy number he tells about the black and white is more creative, if more predictable, than the one uh, about the uh, Episcopalian church. So I, wa I wanted to start with that, Jeremy. I wanted to start with this idea of getting pulled, of thinking you're about to be pulled over, because I think that when we inhabit that space of being demanded to account for ourselves, what the philosopher Althusser calls interpolation, we can feel that when we're demanded to account for ourselves, something is being blocked. We're clenching up. We're justifying ourselves. We feel already guilty, actually, before the law. And that that's exactly what the design of the drug war and the carceral society was designed to do, right? Um, many of you are probably familiar with the, um, I'll share it on the page, uh, interview that came out with um, I believe it was John Ehrlichman, uh, an assistant to uh, Richard Nixon in the 1970s, where he admitted, of course, what many, 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 many people had already kind of deduced, which was the reason why cannabis, marijuana was criminalized was because it was the sacrament of the counterculture. And then if you criminalized it and you criminalized and you whipped up a huge hysteria about heroin, which of course, now we're dealing with a much bigger issue, but if you whipped up a huge hysteria about heroin and associated it with African-Americans, that you could politically target the two groups that were mo most opposed to Nixon, which were the anti-war people and African-Americans. And so this idea that um, what was at stake in the drug war was really you know, a spiritual war. It was a war against metacognition, ultra metacognition. It was a, a war against the recognition that the structural inequalities of racism and the structural inequalities of the maldistribution of wealth um, could be viewed 
from a larger perspective and seen as only symptoms of a particular moment and not necessary. We don't need to live like that is a symptom of uh, ultra metacognition. And where, uh, you know, cannabis, marijuana, particularly as a sacrament of the anti-war movement was circulating as, you know, yes, something that brings joy, but also something which encourages a, a space of contemplation uh, that views the sort of operation of the ordinary chattering monkey mind is rather kind of amusing. And the reason why it might do that is because uh, cannabis can potentiate the chattering monkey mind in a way that can make it go in circles and make it unhappy and uncomfortable. And so one either learns uh, in working with this plant to uh, reflect on the fact that you're simply you know, mirroring your own thoughts to yourself and getting worked up by your own thoughts, or you can end up, you know, being in a thought spiral that, of a negative consequence for quite a long time. And most people learn that they have a kind of capacity to psych psychonautically navigate the cannabis space and to psychonautically navigate the cannabis space more or less requires either intuitively or explicitly this move towards ultra metacognition where you say, okay, I'm just going to chill out. I don't need to worry about that. I'm going to think about something positive. I'm going to think about peace right now. And so that's probably, uh, I think, very suggestive to why it was the sacrament uh, of the counterculture. Um, so I just want to take that moment and kind of pause and be with the drug war as a, as a symptom, as an ontological war, a war against a whole way of being. And, you know, to give thanks and be happy that we seem to be, um, some light seems to be dawning uh, in the drug war, but that um, we ought not to delude ourselves into thinking that the war against an attempt to commodify ultra metacognition is over. Um, it's just a kind of shift in how capitalism, big pharma, the nation state compete for the bandwidth of uh, the human mind in the same way that Buster Friendly and Mercer did or Palmer Eldridge and Leo Bolero did, that it's a kind of war for attention. And uh, now with mindfulness and the uh, widespread uh, or it's officially widespread, but widespread legalization of recreational marijuana, those things are likely to change because both of these practices um, valorize uh, the practice of ultra metacognition. So Charles Freck can't remember his name. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, pause for uh, questions, comments, puzzlements, amusements. Great acts of ultra metacognition. All right, yeah. So we got some some good observations here from our our group. Um, let's see if I can find that one about LBJ. Yeah, recall recall that it's worth noting historically that acid went out with LBJ and downers came in with Nixon. Mm -hmm. That's from Don. Sixty six. Yeah. Um, no, exactly. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't require, we don't have to be conspiratorial about it. I think there's some kind of like widespread, you know, it, it's just the obvious thing to do that, you know, LSD was a uh, cultural, uh, you know, empathogen. It was a, a it was in, inducing all sorts of bouts of ultra metacognition. People were observing the contents of their own lives in a new, in new ways. And, uh, Cannabis was doing the same thing. I think we really underestimate just how powerful cannabis was on the 1960s. I mean, the psychedelics were, of course, extraordinary uh, in their impact, but cannabis is the, you know, the slow dance, you know, <laughs> like uh, ca ca cannabis may, you know, uh, may, may bring us towards, you know, that space of integral knowledge in a kind of more robust way than the probably unlikely to be widespread practice of uh, psychedelics. I think, you know, I think it's yeah. likely to remain a kind of 10 to 20 percent of the population that visits ultra metacognition through psychedelics. You know, I, I hope I'm wrong, but cannabis is the slow jam. 
Yeah, and even even things like you know today they're talking about microdosing and, and yes, big urban environments. But even that's kind of like the slow dance, right? It's a sort of this kind of gradual submersion into these alterities, right? And with with cannabis, it's the same thing. It's it's the thing that you. I mean, I grew up. We all grew up with it, right? It's the thing you grew up with, like under the underpass in your neighborhood mm-hmm. or in the woods with the couch in the middle of the woods. It's it's like mm. this kind of very rhizomatic thing that's so much more effective in changing culture and consciousness it was it was the impetus for the building of most of the communities i ever belonged to because (laughs) you had to form a collective in some way you know uh i know that's why we could invade the three sigma of palmer palmer udders and bring the and bring the hovelists uh some good humboldt county uh weed (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, we got one from Catherine also mentioning is ayahuasca next substance a subculture slash counterculture. I'm sorry about ayahuasca. I think uh, just asking like is ayahuasca next in terms of like the sub she's calling it substance a, you know, just sort of riffing Um, on that. The synchronicity brew. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I, I think um, We've only begun to hear from ayahuasca actually uh, on our culture. Uh, and that's gonna be really interesting to watch how it um, rhizomatically creates communities the way uh, you were talking about cannabis. And I think what's gonna be really interesting is to see how, um, you know, how it kind of percolates and forms cultures of use that are distinct from the shamanic contexts of the upper Amazon and how we learn how to, you know, one of your favorite words, Jeremy, integrate those teachings uh, into this society. And, and I do think that that is going to be a powerful, it's already a powerful and slow process and that that's how it should be that we all have a lot of learning to do. <laughs> and so uh, the idea of uh, kind of just leveling up through a kind of ayahuasca or a uh force and light uh, combo is attractive, but I think that that's going to become, uh, that, that's, again, I hope I'm wrong, but I think that's going to be a very small niche of people who are, um, exploring the space of their own minds in a kind of creative and affirmative way that I don't think people are yet comfortable with uh, in mainstream culture. You know, I think they think about drugs as some, as intoxicants and not as, you know, programming and metaprogramming tools for awareness. And even just having that distinct take on these plant allies, both these plant allies of cannabis and ayahuasca, as well as psilocybin and uh, LSD, that 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 kind of cultural shift, you know, will, will happen in in smaller subcultures. Already has happened in smaller subcultures. That is the transmission of those cultures, but that uh, it, it's the, the larger scale society it feels like as with in scanner darkly there's a desire to commodify and partition and uh you know turn into a a a sellable experience which you can only do so much with with an experience like ayahuasca um i mean you can do it you can commodify it you can turn it into you know uh, and you can medicalize it that's the other thing that will be interesting to see. I think that I personally do not think medicalizing ayahuasca is the way. It's not not the way, but uh, we seem like we desire to bring these uh, experiences into the laboratory because we're, you know, frightened that if they happen anywhere else, that's somehow dangerous. When in fact, like, that's what the earth has been doing <laughs> for thousands of years. And that's only this very modern idea, which is itself a kind of holotape of the drug war, that it's, you know, a priori dangerous. You know, you know, we know it's dangerous. Motorcycles are dangerous. I still like motorcycles, but they're dangerous, you know. Uh, 
psychedelics are a lot of things, but, um, you know, to be respected and used reverentially for sure, but dangerous, I don't think is the first word that should spring to our minds. And that the fact that it sometimes does is one of those symptoms. It's just like Charles Freck seeing the uh, black and white in the rear view mirror. We we're like, that's how powerful our imprinting is with this discourse. For sure. And uh, Donald's bringing up a great point too here, um, just on the kind of religious sacramental imagination with uh, psychedelics. And he's mentioning how, or just psychoactives in Colorado, he's, he's logging in there uh, from Colorado right now. And he says he's thinking Lucky about you. only, yeah, not only the enlightened policy, but the religious element. And so much of the consumption here is edibles and the experience is more entheogenic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've, I grew up in New York and um, now I'm in Florida, which even though it has legalized um, medical marijuana to some degree, um, there've been all of these obstructions, just people kind of like not literally not signing off on legal documents that need to be signed off on to execute what has been voted on by the populace. So there's a great resistance. So I, I can't even imagine the kind of shift that's taking place in a lot of the states that are just wholeheartedly embracing it as as not only a medical but also you know fit within the framework of capitalist consumerism where you can open up a shop there's something else that starts to take place um in in these states and it's fascinating well what i don't see um a lot of uh evidence of and it would be interesting to see if here what donald has to say about this is that the sort of business sector really understands that sacramental part that um, that what we're looking at is an enormous expansion in the possible kinds of set and setting that people can experience cannabis with. That cannabis is very suggestible. It, 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 it likes to be in dialogue with a kind of active, creative mind and kind of moving us out of this booze culture model where we're like getting fucked up and things that are more powerful are more powerful as opposed to you're about to enter into a plant sentience here of a kind of subtle and extraordinary kind. Um, I, again, I don't keep up very well at all with the business press of Rec MJ, but it doesn't, it seems like, that is something uh, which you know Donald is experiencing, but which the business model doesn't really account for. Does 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 he have anything to say about that? Yeah, Donald, uh, feel free. <laughs> yeah, you need the junkies to work the collective farms. He's saying, <laughs> and it didn't happen overnight. Uh, Colorado medical marijuana was first, so yeah, um, it could take time. It could just sort of be medium is the message sort of thing, and if the medium is is kind of a, a a haze of uh, marijuana <laughs> then the message no, I, 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 it's a teacher plant so yeah. it will teach us how to interact with us there's no question about that um but it's just as you're pointing out the, the kind of institutional lag just returning to our definition of what an institution is an institution which is is that which blocks ultra metacognition right so if i say who am i i can say oh i'm an employee of penn state right the institution is that which gives you an answer to who am I? Who am I? I'm an American, right? So that which, you know, the answer to the question of, you know, who am I that I give in the form of a passport. And we so take this for granted, this idea of having an identity like this and that this identity is real, which is really an astonishing hoax if you think about it. That, so, that like since you've been being born, like, there's been an ongoing conspiracy to convince you that you're, you're Jeremy Johnson. <laughs> when you're not, you're that who is capable of manifesting Jeremy. You're also capable of manifesting Bob Arctor or Fred. And that's how you were capable of reading the book about Bob Arctor and Fred. So, um, you know, sports, the way sports is organized so that, you know, who am I? You know, like I am an Eagles fan, right? We like that capitalism has put itself into the business of giving answers to this question, who am I? And now it's kind of entered into the sort of deep political game of making sure, like in the guise of looking more tolerant, 
what we have right now is the obligation to have an identity, right? And the closer people look at their identity categories, they see that they don't make sense. So we keep getting more of them, right? Because because none of the categories can really capture who we are. They're categories. And so um, that's going to be interesting to watch. And I think both, you know, cannabis and ayahuasca should be teachers on that. So uh, this is uh, on the vantage volume. This is 104, but it's chapter seven. It's very shortly in chapter seven. And this is kind of a crucial moment for this line of argument anyway, where um, uh, Fred is uh, talking to Hank, his uh, supervisor, and they're talking about how they're going to be able to get into uh, Arctur's house in order to install the whole scanners, right? And he, so he says, uh, to my own house, he thought, Arctur's house. Up the street of the house, I am Bob Arctur, the heavy doper suspect being scanned without his knowledge. And then every couple of days, I find a pretext to slip down the street and in the apartment where I am Fred, replaying miles and miles of tape to see what I did. And this whole business, he thought, depresses me. Except for the protection and valuable personal information it will give me. And what's interesting about that right there is that, okay, so of course, why does it depress? Who is depressed here? Right? It's, it's not Bob. It's not Fred. It's that who can be Bob or Fred, and that depresses them. No, why is that? I don't think that that's an accident. You know, we're living through a depression epidemic right now. And I think we can even see that, that, that PKD is rubbing up against intuitively here, this idea that identity itself is depressing <laughs> because identity is this attempt to nail the jello of consciousness awareness to the wall. It's the attempt to make us into something that we are not, which is, you know, one entity with one aspect and kind of in control at all times. We're a hive, we're a mosaic of beings, each one of us. And, you know, it sounds scary in Buddhism to say no self, but it's actually glorious because you're actually this array of beings. But when the cop pulls you over, you're demanded to be this one kind of being, right? When the state asks you who you are, you're demanded to be this one kind of being. So this mismatch between this idea that you're an identity, the experience, and the experience, in fact, that you're not an identity. This is a little bit like, I think you know, uh, probably Jeremy uh, Bergson's theory on time, that we experience time as, of course, uh, Fred does, as duration, in other words, just like the experience of time flowing for us in actuality right now. It's not metric, it's not quantitative. It's an experience. But then we treat time as if it could be quantified and we live our lives as if we're living in quantitative time and we never live in quantitative time. We always live in durational time. So this mismatch between the obligation to have an identity and the actuality of being conscious awareness is what these characters are grappling with. And what we grapple with, it seems to me, as we read, because we still, we, we may, through mimesis, right? Through replication, through simulation, start to say like, okay, like, so I am Bob Arctor, the heavy doping suspect being scanned without his knowledge. And then every couple of days, I find a pretext to slip down the street and into the apartment where I am Fred. So, Identity is a spatial phenomenon and a temporal phenomenon, replaying miles and miles of tape to see what I did. And this whole business, he thought, depresses me. And the business depresses him because it's precisely a business, right? Identity is the leading edge of global capitalism that as we speak, like someone is trying to figure out a new way to sell us who we already are, which is just you know, a priori depressing, right? Because we feel ourselves being separated from the full experience of who we actually are. And to me, this is very interesting. We're being uh, streamed on uh, Facebook was the shift from the anonymous web to the web where everybody knows where everybody else, who everybody else is. And, and it's the same kind of gesture. It's this demand 
that we answer to this name. But a name is a very weird information technology, really, that that PKD is going to play with in Valis, where he's going to call himself by several names and get much needed objectivity. But this, this idea of uh, that having to conform to a particular identity is pretty rare in the history of the evolution of human beings, right? You know, n- even names are kind of recent phenomenon, you know, kind of blink of an eye. We've been speaking language for 75,000 years. Uh, in terms of written record, I think names of the sort that we understand now only, you know, come in, in the 17th century. People can look, that would be a good project for the hive mind, the history of names. Um, but I think there's this beautiful moment where this whole business he thought depresses me. And then there's this moment where he says, except for the protection and valuable personal information, it will give me. In other words, by being able to watch the whole tapes of his own house, he feels a kind of uh, security because he's able to see what is happening to him. But of course, at that very given moment, he forgets who he is. He says, it will give me, it will give me. No, it will, it will give Bob, right? Like, or, or it will give Fred. It will not give him. He can say, well, you know, like whichever body gets killed by Barris, it's still the same being. But I think it's worth pausing on this fact that this character is constantly coming up against the possibility that he is neither Bob nor Fred, and that there, that's where freedom resides in realizing that he's neither Bob nor Fred. That's the release of bondage. Uh, that ultra metacognition can be, that gnosis can be, but that the function of the police state and the function uh, of the drugs themselves has the effect of, of course, blocking that ultra metacognition. Now, there is an interesting technology, and then I think we should pause again. There is an interesting technology in the book that doesn't do that, and maybe people can come up with other ones that don't either, that don't block. And that would be, of course, the Cephscope. Uh, The Cephscope, which is Bob Archer's favorite device that he goes home and tunes into. And I always think of the Cephscope as a kind of psychonautical device, right? It's a deep, interceptive device where he's exploring his own consciousness. And it's his favorite thing in the world. It's his treasure is described as. So he has this desire, this impulse to explore the basis of his own awareness. And there's no better way to explore the basis of your own awareness than by altering it systematically and then, see, and then observing the effect of that altering. And that's what the Cephscope seems to, to be. And so, you know, along with ayahuasca and cannabis, I am cautiously optimistic about the possible convergence of technologies of gnosis, uh, technosis, as Eric Davis calls it, um, with the sort of increased cultural emphasis on mindfulness and uh, awareness that in fact, you know, techniques uh, for visualizing meditation, for example, externally on a screen and seeing what you're turning off and on when you're doing various meditative techniques are likely to have, you know, a salutary effect, but there's no substitute for actually just reading books (laughs) And meditating, actually, you know, I always, when people ask about this, I always say, we have the most effective meditating gizmo that we know, right, between your shoulders, and you just have to turn it on itself. But we have this desire to somehow use an adjunct technology to help us do that. And then I would say, well, we already have the plants, so I'm not really sure we need to get that technological on it. But people learn in different ways. And so what is appropriate for myself or what is appropriate for another person is different. I'm just kind of manifesting my my proclivities there that for me, uh, most of the time, kind of technological boxing of these altered states, um, you know, is, is, has a mixed effect. Like right now we get to have this incredible sharing of the collective vibing on a scanner darkly and give testimony to, you know, just the unacceptability and soon to be vanquished nature of the drug war as an ontological crime against uh, the human capacity to imagine themselves and to think freely 
Um, but also, you know, to just enjoy like how good this book is. And I, I personally feel like this is one of the most enjoyable ones because it tugs on the pathos and delivers the, um, it delivers the insights at the same time and it delivers the humor. So lest I keep talking like a hash robot that goes across the border <laughs> saying, I have nothing to declare. Uh, maybe we should pause and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So no, I agree that um, this book in particular um, and by admission, I mentioned this at the beginning, I've only gotten about 70% through it, but I found myself laughing yeah. out loud throughout the book. And the, sure, there are moments when you're reading Philip K. Dick where you, you laugh out loud, but sure. I've just noticed there's a frequency here. That there's uh, the characters, what the, their behavior, their thought patterns, their the, some of the absurdity of the situations, the kind of mania that you yourself start to believe. And you know, you know, like for instance, the whole, you know, um, Donna being in the in the room and they think in the house and they think it might be, you know, and but even even Bob is like, well, what? But he knows what was going on. And yet he's just completely wrapped up in this sort of paranoid conspiracy. Narrative contagion. <laughs> yes. Uh, like you call it, the, like the, the, the way in which Charles Freck can suddenly start finding the aphids and putting them in the jar. Yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting, very subtle thing. All of a sudden, the other characters, oh, yeah, okay, I see them. Here they are. Um, so then you kind of start to go like, well, maybe everybody sees them. Maybe maybe I can see them. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, they're in the narrative contagion. And um, gosh. The uh, greatest or, treatment of stoner discourse I've ever seen in my life. Yes. I, I it, was, it was hyper realistic. Back into yes. youth and growing up and being in the suburbs and being kind of part of that underground of the suburbs you know and it was it was i great. know i mean i i grew up in the 70s and it just it just nails it you know i mean the the and, and and it has to do with that tendency of the story to take on a life of its own like the hash robot you know that everyone is just so suggestible they're living in each other's story now and i think that that's what happens to us when we read a philip k dick novel that we like pretty soon we're seeing the aphids, you know, once upon a time, a guy shook, uh, stood all day shaking bugs from his hair. Right. You know, mm. and you start to really, you know, you want to go in and take a shower and not let your friend in, you know, I mean. Yeah. My wife, Natalie has been asking me what I'm laughing about lately because <laughs> mm. I'm just sort of giggling to myself as I'm reading the book. So I've kind of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of spreading that contagion outward. Well, <laughs> I think that that is so important to Mark because as I, as I keep returning to, you know, somebody interviewed me last week about the uh, uh, 2374 visions. And I think culturally, we've really kind of categorized PKD's effects in this kind of paranoia slash mad category, right? But this is really funny, right? I mean... And, 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 and humor does not come from paranoia. Paranoia is not, I mean, it can be funny in, it, in, its, in its occurrence, but this is really about, you know, it's so funny because it's so true because it names something deep about human being, which is their ability to be, uh, in, you know, affected, infected by a story at the blink of an eye and be absolutely certain that it is so. And, and 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 engage in a kind of collective hallucination, like absolutely certain that there is such a thing as a nation state, absolutely certain that we are these identities that we're told that we are. Those those are the powerful spells that we live under, and uh, when we get to watch them getting caught up in a narrative, we might get a glimpse that we're doing that ourselves all the time. You know that we're getting caught up. And, and agreeing in things that are just not so, you know, agreeing to things that are just not so. Yeah, so a um, few a few comments here. Tessa was saying that aphids are a common hallucination caused by meth cut with, uh, don't know how to pronounce that, strychnine? Strychnine, yeah. Strychnine, yeah. I did not know that. That's interesting. Well, you know, there is a lot of speculation uh, Tessa, so maybe you could tell us, uh, you know, 
that of course in Ubik, some of the, you know, uh, one interesting reading of Ubik is, is that, you know, it's like a crash come down from uh, uh, um, amphetamine high, you know, that everything looks entropic. Um, and I'm not myself fond of the drug explanation for the contents of a narrative, but, you know, what was, uh, what was Phil up to during the, uh, you know, during that period, do you know? Because I know you were involved in some of the composition of Scanner. Yeah, um, like I was mentioning at the beginning, I'm not sure if this is on the recording, um, just a, an exchange between Tessa and I on, on Facebook, uh, because somebody was asking, and she mentioned that she assisted with some of the character development and also with some of the plot towards the end of the book. And I was mentioning to you, Rich, that as I was reading the book, I just, I don't know, it, it just lying on the couch, reading the book, kind of being in that sort of, um, you know, you're sleepy, but you're reading. So it's kind of an, kind of an altered space. state. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden going, T Tessa, I feel like she was involved in writing this somehow. She's involved somehow in this book. And then sure enough, it's confirmed later on Facebook that that is the case. So yeah, Tessa, if you'd like to, if you'd like to share more about this sort of, um, Valis told you. Yeah, maybe it was Valis. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see if there's there's some comments here um, from Dan saying, the idea of escaping from identity entirely is where PKD seems to go beyond Kafka. Yeah. That's exactly. a great point. That's a very good point. Yeah, because with Kafka, it's kind of like you are the guilty one, right? You're the one who's on trial and you don't know why and you're trapped in this thing. But, you know. But here it, there is no you. Yeah, there is no you. You're the, you're, you are the cop hunting after yourself in this, right? So, <laughs> And we all are. I mean, I think that was so brilliant about that. You know, we all are the cops reporting on ourselves. And that's what our internal chattering mind often reports. So there was a one line in the book that was so good that reminded me of the Jiva and Atman, you know, the tr the two birds in the tree. I don't have the line on me, but it was basically Bob kind of going, you know, I am I am both. I am the one who's doing this thing and I am the one who watches. And I was thinking, the oh, like the two wow. birds, like the one who watches yes, and is. the one who's moving around. Yeah, that's straight out of the Upanishads. Yeah. Um this was it's fascinating. I, I have a Kindle version, so it's not I think as... you mean uh let me see, uh, 172. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah, it says uh, to himself, Bob Arctor thought, how many Bob Arctors are there? Yes. A weird and fucked up thought, two that I can think of, he thought, the one called Fred, who will be watching the other one called Bob. And just that just like clicked in my head with the Upanishads. So, yeah. Right. And then you need to be able to count to three there, right? Because who's yeah. the one who's noticing who Fred and Bob are? Yeah. And that's, uh, that, you know, that, that's where the, uh, the liberation from identity that Dan was pointing to uh, can take place. So let's look and see how that might feel. You know the Kindle shot I gave you? Yes. Let me open can that up. Put that up there. Because it's about Scanner, and then it leads to this happiness. Uh, where'd it go? Here it is. So we got this page, and then there we go. There we go. Um, it says, uh, I'm looking at the copy of the Ballantine Scanner, and I can see that what I have to transmute these terrible days into something worthwhile, lasting, good, even important, i.e. meaningful. So, and I think by those terrible days, you know, we could say in part the drug war. This is what God does. This is his strange mystery, how he accomplished this, accomplishes this. When we view the evil, which he's going to transmute, we can't see for the life of us how we can do it. In other words, we see the evil in a dualist way. We don't see the evil as actually harbinger of, as Gurdjieff put it, the coming good. But later on, and only later on, after it's done, we can see how he has used evil as the, cl as the clay out of which he, he, as potter, has fashioned the pot, universe viewed as artifact. So the universe is being created out of this struggle, 
uh, and then we further on down, I am really very happy. Snuff, music, and cats, friends, and my exegesis, my studying and gradually more and more understanding my gnosis. When in 374, the Savior woke me to full consciousness for the first time in my life. And I, I think this is really important to mark because it's true that the exegesis uh, over and over is kind of chewing on, ruminating on explanations of the epiphanies uh, and the acts of ultra metacognition that he'd experienced. Um, but I think it's easy to overlook the fact that like, you know, there are periods at least, and again, Tessa can tell us more of extraordinary happiness and extraordinary insight. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that is at least as much who PKD is, right, you know, as the sort of inducer of the paranoid vision. But the paranoid vision is actually in, in service of something. It's in service of, you know, the exploration of into who is having the paranoid vision. So I'm really very happy, snuff, music, and cats, friends, and my exegesis, my studying, and gradually more and more my understanding, my gnosis, when in 374, the Savior woke me to full consciousness. And th this is just intriguingly unacceptable in mainstream literary culture, you know, that somebody could have had a Gnostic event, you know, that we, we, we can't just accept that on its own terms. We have to sort of somehow come up with some other explanation like temporal lobe epilepsy or, you know, you know, many of us have had these experiences. We can have these experiences right now. We are having these experiences right now. They are our birthright. But I find it intriguing that mainstream literary culture, aka an institution, functions, it's almost like its unspoken rule is that this is impossible. Even as it extols the power of fiction to like alter our experience, the idea that like a fiction writer could, you know, help us see that our own identity is a fiction is just somehow too much. And you can say, oh, well, you know, he has to go and bring up the savior. So maybe it's that. But I mean, in every other sector of our culture, we revere this sort of religiosity, you know, and spiritual, like, why is it? that it's to so totally unacceptable, you know, from the pr perspective of mainstream literary culture, and then we look at it as something to be diagnosed. Right? And again, to me, pretty intriguing parallel to the drug war, where, you know, that the state itself and, you know, the cultural narratives that we inhabit all warn that this space of exploring the ground of our own awareness is dangerous, taboo, and makes you sound like a nut. <laughs> um, in which, you know, yeah. but I am really very happy. Snuff music and cats, friends with my exegesis. <laughs> I mean, nice life, right? I mean, He's, you know, we don't wonder at Darwin exploring the diversity of the natural world. Why should we wonder at PKD exploring the diversity of his internal world? He's exploring the space of all possible thoughts. What a glorious mission. And I feel like we get to do that a little bit when we read along with him. Well said. And, you know, it's interesting, too, within the humanities, right? You're studying literature and you're supposed to be kind of you're triumphing subjectivities, memory and, 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 and Proust, right? And yeah. the kind of these hidden subjectivities, these layers and layers of meaning and experience and phenomenological encounters, right? Oh, my God. Life is so you, much deeper than I thought. Yeah. But you can't go into Gnosis. You're, you can't go that deep. You can go as far as memory, 
you know, and that kind of, you know, seeking the traces of identity through memory and sensation and, and literature and subjectivity, but it, the subjectivity can't go so far into the transpersonal or into the kind of mystical or into the gnosis. So yeah, there's, there's a kind of borderline, there's a fence set up even within the discourse. Well, and, and, and one sign of that, Jeremy, is that, and why I'm so glad to be participating on a platform such as this one, is that, you know, another writer who really goes to this space of gnosis um, that was identified, you know, by psychedelic culture as being that was Herman Hesse. And, and Hesse, you know, explicitly goes there in Siddhartha and Damien that, you know, you're really exploring the nature of your own awareness. You're trying to experience gnosis, that literature is in the service of gnosis. And who's both, I think, the best-selling German language author in the United States over the past 50 years and totally absent from the academy at the same time? Because it's not acceptable. We, we don't teach Hermann Hesse in schools. Like, don't you think, like, why isn't Siddhartha taught in every high school, right? Well, because it doesn't, you know, promise cultural capital. It doesn't promise like mastery, like you're talking about. It, it asks people to actually look at the source of their own awareness. So I think it's going to be very interesting as mindfulness and cannabis culture and ayahuasca culture make the difference in our culture that we might have a rebirth of relationship to a literature that can go, that can be used for gnosis. And that's why I say each week that we're engaging in this radical act together and it's the, that it's the radical act of reading. Because, you know, if we immerse ourselves in this, we can't avoid states of consciousness that otherwise just don't occur. They're not, they're not uh, created by binge watching. They're not created by, you know, the work we do every day, most of us. They're not created by cooking, although there's lots of great states are created by cooking. They're created specifically by this immersive reading into a text that is asking us to ponder our own identity, either consciously or non-consciously. So I think Philip K. Dick is only going to get more popular, therefore, as we become a culture that is more comfortable with ultra metacognition. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so right now, of course, we've, we've touched on this over the past few weeks on how Philip K. Dick has really become again, once again, a cultural force with all of the movie adaptations, the electric dream shows, but it, it's missing that, what we're saying, that kind of the exegesis, the, the playing with the gnosis, the truly dissolving of reality, not just making it trippy, not making a head trip, yeah. not just kind of yeah. fooling the, the reader along and know, not knowing what's going on. Sure, the vertigo is there, but the vertigo is there with very deep theological mystical questions and those were always present even you know in in ubik yes. so you know i think it's only a matter of time as you know psychedelia and consciousness culture and pop culture and o culture are just kind of in the in the 21st century they're just kind of in a large hadron collider just smashing into each other and those differences are going away i think it's only a matter of time until we start getting into the the high weirdness factor yeah, um, more in a mainstream way. Um, well, so I, and I think that that's why, um, you know, anyone who's participating in this seminar and 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 thinking or you know or listening to it and thinking along these lines is that is part of the uh, you know frontier that that like it's not clear how that's going to go down. In other words, it's it's definitely clear that uh, capitalism and pop culture are going to take an interest in these states of high weirdness. Um, and just as in the past religion has, right? In other words, that we might be in this post-religion moment where ecstasy is finally ready to be commodified uh, fully, more fully, right? And, and turned into part of the sort of global capitalist delivery system. But, my own inkling is, is that that can't really work. That um, the, the deep introspective experiences that are occasioned by these uh, 
alterations of our consciousness really point us away from this kind of more, 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 more ethos because it's so fertile. I literally could just read the exegesis for the rest of my life and it's mostly probably what I'm going to do, right? You know, I mean, like it's, there's no need for more. Nobody needs to write any more books. <laughs> like as far as I'm concerned, you know, we're, we're done. You know what I mean? That, um, that this kind of unspoken, we always need to be producing more heaping goods up on the surface of the earth. It's, you know, it's clearly on its way out, right? Peak stuff, right? That, um, that in fact, human beings are happy, not by no means is most of the planet at this level, but human beings are happy at a much lower rate of consumption than that at which is being kind of like encouraged and projected in the current context in which people believe they sort of need to be able to produce enough economic value to sustain because otherwise they could never be happy. But happiness actually occurs as it did for PKD, you know, out of this practice of exegesis, out of this practice of interception. It's what our mind is trying to do, it's what our bodies are trying to do, which is to investigate itself and to investigate its local context and express itself lovingly. And that, in fact, you don't need nearly as much stuff to do that as the narrative would have it, right? Doesn't mean we all need to be monks. It just means that this idea of ever increasing growth of consumption is not likely, well, first of all, we know it's not sustainable ecologically, but it's also not likely to sustain itself just psychologically, right? So uh, I think uh, it's worth experimenting with the idea that we're on the cusp of a kind of renaissance of introspection uh, where people realize that what they've got between their shoulders is so much better than any VR rig that anyone will ever design. And that to start inspecting that, start working with this Ceph scope right here, right, um, is really the future. You know, so like, for example, if you told somebody in 1974, oh, you know, people are going to not want to drink beer that is from like big breweries and they're going to want it to taste, have a taste to it. They're going to like use a lot of hops and there's going to be this total explosion this gastronomical explosion associated with beer they would say uh yeah right like no it's gonna be Budweiser and Michelob and some Miller and that's gonna be it you're not gonna but instead we got the Burgess shale of diversity of you know brewing and I think that, that you know not in a direct way but augers were likely to experience like oh wow right experience you know, we're gonna do we're gonna do this so much. We're gonna do the phone and everything so much. Not to sound too much like an old guy, but the phone and just all the screens. And we're gonna say, you know, the screen is really cool. But ah, oh, the other day, I was looking for the source of my own consciousness, and I was kind of filled with this incredible kind of suboptical light. This brightness I felt. I really felt like I was filled with vitality, just like, you know, looking, inspecting the ground of my own being. I really highly recommend it. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's like the McLuhan aspect, right? That the, the sloughed off medium becomes a work of art in the next oh, yeah. So it's like, and I've noticed this in myself. Um, I'm just as guilty, you know, growing up with the iPad and the smartphone starting to come out, you know, right at the end of college for me, like a decade ago. Right. Yeah. Um, and then getting kind of engrossed in oh, the power and the magic of the screen and then getting bored with it. And yeah. now kind of coming back, oh, you know, I need pen and paper to take notes and really remember things and to kind of just have this experience. And I know there's, there's the, the, the indie bookstores are coming back just not on a mundane level, you know, yeah. indie bookstores are flooding, you know, um, towns and cities all over the U S coming back. Whereas before it was, you know, the kind of Barnes and Noble McDonald's of, of bookstores. Um, so there is a kind of, yeah, McDonald's burgers again. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, once we kind of, 
chase this projection, I suppose, this kind of yeah. exteriorization of our consciousness into matter and realize it's just a screen. Yeah. You know, who's the one really, who's the one who made that an enchanting experience? It's That's it. Consciousness, right? Who is so, the magician who makes the grass green? Yeah. Robert Anton Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Joseph's saying law of diminishing returns. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, we've got a good comment here, a little synchronous. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, uh, an electronic synchronicity, synchromysticism. Uh -huh. um, Carrie on the Facebook feed, watching us on Facebook, saying that I was, I was flicking through my Facebook feed just now and came across this. The truth is a snare. You cannot get it without being caught yourself. You cannot get the truth by catching it yourself but only by it's catching you by uh, Kierkegaard. And then she says, and here you are talking about epiphanies. So cool. Thanks for joining us, Carrie. I'm glad yeah. you, you met us at that intersection of experience. And there. Kierkegaard is the being who sent me to graduate school. I read Kierkegaard. Oh, wow. I said, okay, I need to go and do this on purpose. Um, but you know, but, but what's, the good news is, is that actually we don't need to find the truth. We just need to eliminate the bullshit and then the truth shines. Um, so I, I agree with that Kierkegaard quote that we don't like, that, you know, that it, it finds us, but the way it finds us is that we eliminate belief in these, these idols like identity, like the state. And we like experience in metanoia where we realize like, Oh, look, love is real. Okay. Awareness is real. Those are the things that are real matter comes and goes okay like you know even bodies especially bodies come and go but love empathy awareness these things are always there they like if when we practice them we experience their non-transience and so just practicing experience the difference between that and you know that's what makes the uh, i think the characters so charming you know when they're horrified we're horrified along with them when we read you know, if I knew it were harmless, I would have killed it myself. Is a kind of return of that empathy perspective that PKD is offering in androids. And this this kind of that what we all witness that is this idea that you know that the perspective that would sort of kill the harmless is it's it's like nails on a chalkboard, you know. It's just at odds with who we really are. This isn't our true nature. And you can say, oh, well, look around on the planet, Mobius. You know, look at what people are doing. Yeah, but that, that's actually not our true nature. It comes from the desperate attempt at looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, we're looking for, we're looking to satisfy externally what we can only find internally through that experience of pure awareness that we're all looking for. We're all looking for that. There's no question. We all want to be happy. I mean, nobody could ever argue. Like, I mean, I, I had some graduate students once try to argue with that hypothesis, which I encouraged in them. It's like, good, you should argue with everything. But every sentient being is trying to be happy. The idea that we're not trying to be happy. I mean, of course we are, but we just, we have a wrong view and we think that we can make ourselves happy through shifts in our external reality when those shifts in external reality can only be uh, enjoyed through a transformation of an internal reality. And indeed the external reality is not irrelevant to the internal reality because the internal reality definitely prefers some forms of external reality, but it's not the causal part of happiness. Our happiness is uncaused. So if we eliminate the bullshit, we'll be happy. My experience. <laughs> No, you bring up a great point too about um, the empathy thing going on again in the book, and yeah. he can he goes into very careful, compassionate couple of paragraphs about cats and animals and how yeah. heads really more than other people will go out of their way and they'll go out of like they'll go out of their trip to like help the cat through the window and the broken oh, glass, yeah. make the sure it's okay. The the painstaking, you know pulling of the cat out of the window with the shards of glass such a beautiful treatment there i think because um you know i mean we we other like every subculture gets othered right 
And I don't think PKD is painting a rose, you know, tinted perspective on this particular drug culture. You know, they're like growing up in the suburbs, as you did, Jeremy, you can also notice that like there were definitely toxic aspects of those drug cultures. You know, it wasn't simply, you know, when things turn in on themselves, sometimes it's not all sweetness and light. Um, but I think that that there was something there in those spinoffs from the counterculture that was caring right at the moment that the sort of mainstream culture was beginning to valorize again, just like taking, accumulating, you know, acquiring, greed is good, um, makes these characters look almost, you know, tragic, like they're like tragic heroes, right? That the very thing, the very practices that they're engaging in that remind them of their fundamental empathy with all things is also slowly, you know, separating them from, from each other. You know, that Barris and Arctur are clearly, you know, not bros, you know, like that, uh, that, there, that there is a kind of like malevolent force that can come in as soon as the ego, which is what Barris is doing, tries to somehow map this unfathomable oneness of all things and things that can understand it. So, you know, I didn't want to paint too rose colored of a picture about 70s drug culture, but I don't think PKD does. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things earlier I forgot to mention in the comments was uh, the whole uh, two hemispheres. Yes, Penfield. Um, so was the, so I, the general question was, was, was Philip K. Dick kind of, he must have been reading about the stuff. Um, I know it kind of got popular in the 70s with Julian Jaynes and the bicameral mind. Maybe maybe Tessa could help answer that well, too when he was reading well, it. Well, time. Tessa prepares. I can definitely say that there's these interesting letters between PKD and Julian Jaynes uh, about his use of vitamin C and the drop in the GABA levels, which was one of his hypotheses of what happened in 2374. And that's a really like talk about the ghost of Marshall McLuhan. That book, uh, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian James is really a kind of like forgotten classic. It's as if it never existed. Um, the Penfield is much earlier. The hemispherical uh, characteristics of the brain. I, I don't you know, but it's, I think it's from the 50s. And, you know, certainly and again, Tessa can fill us in, but. Certainly PKD was reading it because he's citing directly from it um, here and there when he's getting examined uh, in the office that the uh, bicameral nature of the, the, the hemispherical nature of the brain is being articulated. And looking in the exegesis, you know, he's reading all kinds of, you know, interesting psychological texts, psychology, you know, psychology today comes up a lot. And my guess would be that he was following the, um, you know, the, I guess the bibliographies that were in there. Um, yeah, Tessa's just mentioning he read he read about the split brain in Psychology Today. Aha, uh -huh, perfect. We we synced. And, <laughs> and after reading the magazine, Phil went out to the library at Cal State Fullerton to read more about the split brain. Chase, chase the bibliography. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I mean, and and that's the thing, you know, where he says study there. This is the thing I have so much respect about is that, um, you know, part of this separation of our culture that like that academic culture carries out is that a lot of the greatest intellectuals that we've had are self-taught and outside of schools and so forth. And I would put PKD into that category that, you know, the sheer diversity of materials that he's incorporating into the exegesis and as we see incorporating into his novels is so exemplary and refuses the kind of, uh, I don't know, tunnel vision, a lot of experts in different fields. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm not picking on him, but like if you put PKD next to somebody like Steven Pinker, a big public intellectual, 
you know, there isn't that same kind of syncretic absorbing awareness. It's more like I have the answer and I'm going to use that answer to explain things across different domains or Richard Dawkins, same thing. I'm going to use that knowledge to explain things across different domains. Whereas Dick is kind of more motivated by a series of questions that are kind of deeper questions than I think either of those people are really asking. And so therefore he just is ravenous going across, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica, Psychology Today, you know, pre-internet, but just Cal State Fullerton Library going for it. And that's a beautiful thing, I think. And we can all do that. Like the library system of the United States exists and you can, you know, and all over the world, you know, you don't even need to have, you know, internet is an incredible thing, but getting into the library and really looking and seeing these primary do documents, a lot of which have not been digitized, and these articles, history of science alone, it's incredible. And it's hardly being touched because we're all looking at our screens, you know? So maybe I need to give an assignment for people to go to libraries. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love I personally love libraries as as um someone who would buy all the books if they could, but obviously couldn't afford that. So <laughs> libraries Why should we buy them be, when we can just own them together? I, I love that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I really like about them. And and I'm the kind of guy who always forgets to put them back in time. So I'm always getting like 10 cent fees or more. And I don't mind that. I'm yeah. like, yes, here is my patronage. Keep this yeah. building open. <laughs> Keep buying the books for us, you know? Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And and what's interesting is there, because I've always had the same relationship. I always give books away and I don't really want to own books. I want to have access to books. Like they're not mine, you know, and, and having that feeling I think is, uh, is, is beautiful because you feel yourself participating in a very long culture and we can all, we're all being invited to do that at any time. There's this long cultural transmission that is happening and we can participate in it. It doesn't matter what our job is or what our education is. We're capable, everyone's capable of reading Philip K. Dick. Everyone's capable of reading Marshall McLuhan. And we could, well, everyone's capable of reading Gurdjieff, you know? And we can enter into this conversation, which we need to have as a planet. We, ne we need to have this conversation. And, you know, it's going to be had you know, about what our purpose is, how we can best sustain ourselves, you know, in the 21st century and not die. And, <laughs> and that's what we've always done. And that's what we're going to do. And I, I think that there's going to be a kind of, uh, you know, biognosis where we do enough of this ultra metacognition and we start to realize, you know, like, hey, we're living beings in contact and connection with other living beings and we're being hosted by this planet which is itself alive and we have kind of obligation to those planets to that planet which is higher than any law <laughs> in fact because it, it's what we are and also at the same time that we should be putting whatever resources that we can into research into light speed uh, approaching light speed travel because it's worth listening to people like Stephen Hawking who say we have about a hundred years. Either way, these conversations about ultra metacognition, whether we get to stay or not, or they get to leave and, or, or whether we go extinct, these are going to be the way we go out. We're going to have to, we're going to have to follow them fathom our own talos, our own purpose, one way or another. And Dick's going to be part of the way because he asks us to reflect on who we are in a way that few authors do. That's, um, that's quotable right there, Rich. <laughs> um, yeah, so Tessa's saying it looks like you didn't give away Scanner Darkly, though. <laughs> in terms I didn't of give away, away Scanner books. Darkly? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I have other copies. Oh. <laughs> this is this is just my personal favorite <laughs> no i always i like i i i really it's, it's it's probably the most books i've ever given away are by philip k dick i just give them to people because you know if they're going to read them that they'll buy other ones they'll read other ones they'll go to the library 
um, it's not something you can't have just one. It's like potato chips, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Dan is saying, uh, if I was better at remembering what I read, I'd give more books away. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I hear you. Yeah. Here's, here's a question from Joe. Uh, Joseph ask, is asking, did, did you have any thoughts on the Teilhard de Chardin post? Yes. Thank you. Um, and I have it here. Unless you want to read it. Advantages yeah. 127. Yeah. yeah, why don't you read it? Okay. Um, so it's, he to whom it is given to see Christ more real than any other reality in the world. Christ everywhere present and everywhere growing more great. Christ, the final determination and plasmatic principle of the universe. That man indeed lives in a zone where no multiplicity can distress him. And which is nevertheless the most active workshop of universal fulfillment. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd be, I'd be inter- who asked the question again? That was uh, Joseph. Joseph yeah, I'd be interested to see what Joseph thinks, but, you know, I know that the first several times that I read this book, I didn't notice that. And of course, uh, Teilhard becomes very important uh, in the exegesis when PKD will say, you know, that he's had a similar vision as, to, as Teilhard's, and he starts using the language of the noosphere to describe this kind of unified field of consciousness uh, that he's pointing to. Um, and I think the reason I was delighted to see it in Scanner Darkly is that you're seeing kind of a bunch of characters suffering because they have to dwell in the domain of duality. In other words, they have to dwell in the domain of cop and criminal, uh, you know, the sinner and saint, as the Rolling Stones put it, but also just, you know, self and other, you know, that Arctur is sleeping with his revolver, his gun under his pillow because he's worried about Barris, who's making his 50 cent silencer or however much it was. Um, and so this sense of division and discord that you're seeing where people's like the hemispherical relationship between brains or cephscopes is itself being severed, right? And, and cut that Teilhard, there's an outburst about Teilhard right in the middle of it which is pointing to the actual unity of all things, right? That Christ everywhere present, everywhere growing more great, Christ the final determination and plasmatic principle of the universe. What is that, Archer said? Jardin, Teilhard de Jardin. Jeez, Luckman, that man indeed lives in a zone where no multiplicity can distress him, which, and which is nonetheless the most active workshop of universal fulfillment. I would put that next to, I'm really very happy, Snuff, music and cats, friends and my exegesis, uh, my studying and gradually more and more understanding my gnosis. I mean, because the hallmark of gnosis and, you know, what Teilhard points to over and over again is that, you know, only he who loses his life can save it. He says he uses explicitly uses the terminology of ego death so that he can experience unity with God. And what we're looking at are a bunch of characters who are being forced to have egos, right? You know, the, the, the character Fred literally is the ego of the employee <laughs> who has to be Fred and who has to, you know, play Bob Arctor. So they're, you know, the, 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 the pure infinity of actual awareness that some of these characters are becoming aware of, just again, just as inklings. Luck, Luckman is having an inkling here, or at least he's playing a joke that is pointing to that inkling, that it's being wrenched into this world of duality, that a world of unity is constantly being separated into a world of duality, and that we, if we can remember while we're in that world of duality, then in fact it is fundamentally a world of unity, that, you know, what is uh, evil, as, as uh, PKD says, this is the strange mystery. When we view the evil, we can't see for the life of us how we can do it. But later on, and only later on, after it's done, we can see how he has used evil as the clay out of which he as potter has fashioned the pot. In other words, the good and evil are not oppositions. The darkness and light are not oppositions. And Barris and Arctur are not oppositions, but in which no multiplicity can distress them. Right? 
but that as long as we dwell in that realm of duality, of course, it's hell, basically. This is a world of hell where we're separated from reality. So I, I liked the little outburst there. You know, I never Googled it or looked, though. I, I was guessing that it was from, uh, it's probably from Phenomenon of Man, would be my guess, which is the most read uh, Teilhard de Jardin book. Um, but other books, if you're ever interested in reading some Teilhard, the hymn, hymn to the Universe is very beautiful. And again, you just read it, you use it like the Cephscope. You know, the signals that go into the Cephscope don't have to be real. They just have to, you know, alter your awareness. You don't have to believe in Christ uh, to experience the ego death that, um, well, maybe you do, but not all of us do, uh, to experience the ego death that uh, Teilhard is pointing to there, that you give up this local version of self and experience a kind of larger version of self in which no multiplicity can distress us. It's so large that everything is one thing. Yeah, so this is interesting with, with Teilhard, um, because in a lot of media, I feel like he he often shows up this way. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these kind of little theophanies mm -hmm. where the whole world gets quietly summed up. And, and um, you know, Flannery O'Connor is another one, another famous yeah. literary writer, um, you know, got, uh, Southern Gothic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just like the title of the book and maybe some of the implicit themes, him being a Catholic. And if you've ever read her letters, her big book of letters, I have it over here, Habit of Being, um, she's just like, you, you can tell like, oh, my friend recommended Teilhard to me. I'm going to check him out. And then for the rest of the book, for the next 10 years of her life, she's recommending Teilhard to everybody in her, in her field, in her, you know, her network of letters. So I just think it's kind of interesting. And then I remember too, even in a science fiction show, Lost, just oh, quietly yeah. at the end of the show, somebody's on a bench reading um, Everything That Rises Must Converge. So just a little interesting kind of mini theophanies here in media. No, I, 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 I totally agree. Yeah, and it's so. very interesting because Teilhard was, you know, the object not only of suppression by the church, but um, by science. You know, the, the phenomenon of man received a review um, by a Nobel Prize winning, uh, somebody who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine, who just basically said uh, that it was, you know, drivel. You know, that because it's a little bit like somebody shows up to a uh, concert, a beautiful, say, symphony, uh, and they say, well, all I hear is a bunch of noise, <laughs> right? You know, a bunch of different sounds. <laughs> And they're not able to, like the, like the scene with the 10-speed bike, they're not able to experience the relation between the sounds. And uh, the review of Medawar, yeah, Peter, Sir Peter Medawar, in, uh, that's available, I'll put it online, is such a hatchet job on Teilhard that it kind of is part of this whole science versus spirit perspective that is really well out of date right in other words like that's the product of the war between the church and early modern scientific authority who had the right to describe the world metaphysically but it's totally has no place in contemporary culture where science is actually investigating a lot of these metaphysical questions and so when Medawar just treats it as nonsense he just what he does is he cites long quotes doesn't understand them and then claims that they're nonsense, which is, to me, similar to some of the uh, reception uh, of the exegesis that uh, we're incapable of just opening ourselves to the fact that a text might be able to induce in us an experience. And it's an experience that, as much as we might like to cling to the empirical reality of our senses, it's not true. It's not actual, it's not real. And that beyond the world of the, the multiplicity of our senses, there's something else. And that something else needs to be explored by each of us individually. And it doesn't need to simply be poo-pooed and, uh, and mocked because we've not yet just, just uh, been able to develop a very crude instrument for measuring it. <laughs> and so um, 
you know, that, that, that's the way in which I think Teilhard and PKD are also brothers. It's not just that they both turn into the noosphere, but that they were tuning into the noosphere at a moment that uh, certainly mainstream culture was not yet ready to sort of admit the possibility of their, uh, you know, their vision. Mm. Yeah. So I know we're coming up towards, Oh, actually we're over 90 minutes now. Wow. <laughs> this one. Flew by. No, this is wonderful. Um, you know, uh, so I just want to bring up one or two other things from yeah. our community here. And Dan was just saying earlier on in his comment, I think it sums it up very well. Um, our experience of the reading here. He says, I thought this was the best novel so far to the point where it seemed to involve a different method of writing. Uh, it read as if none of the scenes were written before PKD had imagined them to a depth of material, objective detail that is almost cinematic, capturing the total environment. As a result, there's a density to Scanner that is unlike the other books, and it pays off emotionally over the course of the novel. Yeah, that's, I, that's really well put. I really agree, and, but I, and I'd be interested to see if Dan thinks that when we read Vallis, because I feel that they have a similar feel in that way, that Vallis achieves that as well and it's that same yeah. mixture of pathos and humor again but this time it's phil and horse lover fat not fred and bob arctor yeah i would wonder that too um i don't well i look forward to rereading valis actually uh, to, to kind of re-experience that um let's see if there's any other closing statements here from anybody anybody who wants to say anything talking a little bit about Teilhard and um, how Teilhard was, you know, a paleontologist as well as, as yeah, a theologian. PK man. Yeah. Um, so he kind of, he, he was straddling the, the scientific, the theological, and then, you know, as maybe like William Aaron Thompson would say, the kind of mythopoetic imaginative flights that kind of in that sort of metacognitive state. Yes bring the two together and show how they're interrelated in this sort of larger imaginative poetic Beautiful. connection. Yeah. Integral. Yeah, definitely integral. Uh, Warren saying de um, definitely can't, can't be prepared, uh, compared. I can't say scanner is better than Ubik as they are so vastly different. Mm. That's a good point too. Um, yeah. Part of, part of it is the, uh, Dan is saying this, uh, part of it is the extreme detail of the scenes and conversations. There's a weight to the people involved in them. Yeah, in my mind's eye, as I've been reading the book, it's the, the neighborhood, the suburbs, the houses, the personalities, the car that they're sitting in. I can almost kind of smell the, you know, a damp old car kind of smell. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's very vivid. So I would definitely agree. Um, yeah. So, okay. Well, I, I guess we should wrap it up now. Um, but before we do, there's two things I wanted to bring up. Uh, first of all, our next class will be, uh, let's see, let me open it up. I, I, I forgot what we're doing next. I'm feeling Vallis, but I don't know. Feeling Vallis. Let's see. Cause then we could do Vallis and then go to exegesis. Oh, that's a great point. So we should do that then. Let's do Vallis. And what did we have written down here? And that's what we had anyway. Uh -huh. I'm not myself, horse lover, fat Vallis. And then the exegesis. Cool. So we're on, we're on, we're on track. We can't uh, avoid it. It wasn't our plan in the first place. Uh, Squy T. Ocker, interesting name there. Uh, Vallis fell off my bookshelf today. <laughs> oh, good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because it was Radio Free Vallis falling off of a shelf that got me on this whole trip. Really? Yeah, it fell off of a shelf at the UC Irvine Library. Oh, so that's how it kind of got started. A little yeah. uh, library angel. I'll tell the story sometime. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Celestial Sparks said it, it chose you. <laughs> uh, I, I feel blessed. So the last thing I want to note is actually for Tessa and Tessa, as um, some of you know, that she has a fundraiser going on um, on you caring. And I wanted to share that with everybody here. If you can give anything to Tessa to help um, 
just a, a, a few different things with, with her house and fixing up her house. It would be very helpful. She's cool. gotten a few donations over the past couple of weeks. Um, she's getting closer to reaching her goal. She's at 35.91 out of 5K. Um, so yeah, um, there's a couple, there's a little paragraph on there. You can learn more about it, but you know, Tess has been so helpful and she's been showing up with us and, and, and giving us this amazing context for Philip K. Dick's life and her own experiences and her own, uh, analysis and thoughts. So, um, if you could help her out, that would be awesome. So I'm also going to leave that in the email, Tessa. Word so to that. that can, uh, get access to that. So, yeah. So I think that's, that's everything, Rich. Um, of course, Tessa, you're welcome. You know, thank you. And uh, Rich, what what should we uh, what should we have in mind as we read Vallis this? I week? think the uh, exploring this space of what uh, is called much needed objectivity. Um, that is the uh, distinction between fill and and fat. And and to think about you know the following thing that almost everyone notices that horse lover fat is a character that has been invented in the book. But we forget that Phil is also a character in the book who's no more actually the author Phil than Horse Lover Fat is. And that what the book may very well be about is this kind of epic journey to discovering that you yourself are a fictional character. I am not myself. And that what is kind of patterning for us is offering us, guiding us in, is this exploration where we can discover that who we thought we were is actually a fictional character that we've been kind of laying over the full infinity of our experience and that we have all this other capacity in there and we need not be, you know, arrested by identity. So much needed objectivity. All right. Great. Same time next week. Same time next week. Um, Thank you, Jeremy. I'll talk to you Wednesday. Yes. Let's chat Wednesday. And one more question. Yeah. Quick one, Joe's just asking, uh, is there a place, a recommendation to get the exegesis a little cheaper than Amazon? You know, any, any, you know, I, I don't know, but that's something for the, cause it was on a uh, remainder for a while and you could get them cheap. I should have bought a whole bunch of them. Um, but, uh, you know, zebrapedia.psu.edu has almost all of the PDFs for the whole thing. Um, that's a really interesting experience because you're actually interacting with PKD's handwriting. Um, but, uh, in the meantime, I'll do a little research and see if we can find, you know, Abe books is usually a good source cause it's online and it, uh, looks to both, uh, new and used copies. I know somebody I recommended the exegesis to recently got a pretty cheap used copy. Um, I'll admit that the Kindle version is very useful because then you can also uh, explore it digitally. Um, but you can do that with a lot of Zebrapedia as well. So, but I'll, I'll take a look. I don't know, but uh, I do like having the physical book. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks and, to everybody. Uh, really appreciate yeah, this opportunity. Everybody. And thanks Facebook. Thanks everybody over there. Uh, we've been, we've been watching you too. Um, so yeah, see you next week and take care everybody. And the recording will be sent to you tomorrow in an email. All right. Thanks, have Jeremy. a good night, Rich. Wednesday. Yep. Take care.